this one, I would start this conversation by saying, let's trucks it up. So my dinosaur there, and here we go. Um, I'm assuming everybody in this room can answer this question, or at least feels pretty comfortable that they know what Vault is. Show of hands, are you using Vault? Do you know what Vault is? Some people are going to be watching this and maybe don't, so we're going to do it quick. Um, these are the three main functions of Vault. When we talk about Vault, we're talking about either a secure key value store, a secret generation tool that's direct, you know, able to generate dynamic secrets from a bunch of different locations, um, or you're talking about the encryption of the service tool to transfer back in. At Zipcar, we're primarily using the secure key value store, and we're sometimes uh, doing dynamic secret generation. We never use the transport backend. Um, so when I start talking about you know using Vault at scale and in multiple data centers, uh, it, it's not none of that information is about transit backend usage. If you are using the transit backend, maybe there's another talk that's good. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of the network diagram of, of a basic Vault interaction, right? An application authenticates to Vault in some nebulous way, uses the secrets that it needs to communicate with, with services that need authentication. Great. We use this model quite a lot too. Your CICD setup needs to read some secrets from Vault. Awesome. Uh, builds up an app manifest, a config file, something like that, and your application can run and communicate with services. Maybe you got a scheduled environment, you got some kind of scheduler that we have, a lot of containers. Same deal, right? Scheduler authenticates to Vault in some nebulous way, reads, secure, uh, keys, gets values that it needs to do its work. When you're generating secrets, same deal, right? Weird way to authenticate to Vault, whatever you pick. Vault can also reach out to some service on the app's behalf and generate a secret and give it back to the app. The nice thing about that is that you can now manage that application's access through Vault. You can revoke its access, you can audit it, see what's going on, how often it's requesting access. Super useful and cool. Vault has tons of secrets engines. I couldn't fit them all on a slide because I don't know how to do two columns, I'm sorry. But this is a lot of them. Uh, but Vault's also for people, right? And like, if you have a lot of environments, like we have a lot more than three, uh, and so like it's kind of wild. Like you're a person, you're an operator, and you need to bounce around between multiple vaults. And so in Zipcar, we have kind of this global vault that stores high-level infrastructure things, um, compiled versions of manifests, stuff like that. Um, and then inside each environment, we have an environment-specific vault that's all secrets for just that environment. Maybe certain things from global. Um, end up in there as well, like you know, an API key that's common across the board or whatever, so that any application does not have to talk to global vault. Global vault's for people and scripts that people run. And that's a pain. And so, uh, does anybody have multiple vaults or multiple vault? Yeah. Right on. If you don't and you're already using vault, you will. Sooner or later, someone's going to say, let's do a separate vault for that. Um, if you need to bounce between vaults, Safe is an incredible CLI tool to do that. It's from Stark and Wayne. Um, my good friend Jay Hunt is a, a big contributor to that. And uh, it has a safe target command, which is going to cache your authentication information, your tokens from Vault, which is not really any different than what Vault CLI does. Once you auth with Vault, it's going to write in your home directory a dot Vault token. So there's no real additional security footprint there. Um, and it allows pass through to other Vault commands, which is super useful because Safe doesn't support It's not a one to one match with the API. They're not trying to replace the Vault CLI. They're trying to give you helpers. Vault CLI can do things like list paths, which is useful, but it's not very recursive. There's not a lot of recursive tools in the CLI, and that's by design. Safe, on the other hand, does have those things. It lets you visualize paths and trees, lets you do uh, recursive removals and know you got everything, which is awesome. And there's lots of other helpful wrappers that we're going to discuss shortly. This is what targets looks like. List of vaults. You pick one. You switch. It tells you which one you're on. Great. The pass through looks like that's just a regular vault token lookup command. You can see in this particular case, the person was authenticated as a root token, and you get information about that. Um, this could be any vault command safe, vault, whatever you would run normally if you were running the vault CLI. This is what some of that recursive tooling looks like. Um, the nice thing I think specifically about safe paths is if you run just vault list, you don't get the full secret path. And that means if you're writing automation scripts, you need to then like build up that full path to that secret again, which is a little more error prone. Whereas in this case, you can dump a whole bunch of paths um, and rip out the one that you want and get the full path to the secret, which is cool. Tree can also be useful if you're you know, trying to troubleshoot a problem, you want to see what the state of your vault is. So at Zipcar, uh, the way that we bounce between all of our vaults is we have a single infrastructure repo for all the deployments that we manage. And that contains 
operator scripts, maintenance scripts, and metadata for each environment. Each environment has a folder, and then there's a bunch of metadata in there. So that's everything from, you know, we, we use Bosch, anybody, Cloud Foundry, Bosch community? Cool. So, um, you know, we're, we're bouncing between compiling manifests to deploy our infrastructure, and that's where those scripts live. And those metadata files that they're communicating with are the source of truth for what your infrastructure should look like. And this is a quick bash example. You can imagine vault address being like, you know, fetched from some meta file instead of being hard coded like it is. One uh, thing to know, uh, this script is going to switch between vaults and it doesn't require you to say, okay, every operator that might use vault needs to use the exact same alias name. Because that's, you know, string magic, not, not fun. Um, the URL, however, really can't change. If you're talking to the right vault, it's the URL. Unless you're the DNS and hijack, but I'm going to get all scared now. I'm not going to talk about that. It's a different talk. You will notice that safe's um, informational output, so safe targets, for example, that, that outputs that, that kind of thing, that's all on standard error. So you'll see this script is piping standard error to standard out. For those who aren't familiar with bash, that's what that wacky two and one thing is. Um, then you just grep for your address and you use awk to get the, the proper one, and if it's not, you can tell the operator, hey, there's no way to do this. So that's how we uh, safely bounce around, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> safely bounce around between our vaults in, in automation scripts. So um, if, if you have multiple vaults you think you might, you should try out safe. And you should write custom scripts that use safe. <laughs> now, that's how vault works for people. I want to dive into the main portion of this talk, which is like, what do I mean by scale? Right? What, what am I talking about um, when I'm saying, you know, we're managing a lot of vaults for sure. Uh, Zipcar has a lot of users. We're in 10 countries. We have 25 production environments. Some of those are like multi-tenant white labels, not that it matters. Um, and we have over 6,000 container instances running across all of our environments right now. We have 12 HA vault deployments, um, which is just part of a larger kind of service landscape at Zipcar. And our engineers are shipping code to production all day, every day. And when I look at this slide, I get out of it that vault has to be up. If you're using Vault in any of those network diagrams we talked about before, Vault being down is a huge problem because so many pieces of infrastructure, so many people are relying on it. And sure, the apps that might be running may continue to run depending on how you set it up if Vault is down for some time. But all of the reasons you're using schedulers, all of the reasons you have self-healing infrastructure, if your Vault server is down, you no longer have that. Now you just have old, broken infrastructure that makes everyone sad. And so, um, we want to make sure that we can deal with that kind of thing. And I don't think this list of, of kind of scale points, these are the things I think about when I think about scale. I don't think this list is specific to Vault. This is for anything that you want to scale. You have to understand how it's going to behave under load. You have to be able to define what your load is going to be. You need to be able to meet and measure SLA requirements. And this isn't necessarily like a lawyer is going to come and make you sign it or make your manager sign it. It might just be, as I said, your, your, your colleagues are depending on your infrastructure to be up to do their work. Maybe you've got multiple environments, multiple data centers. You certainly should be confident in how the application is supposed to work so you can spot anomalies. And I don't think you can effectively do scale without good tooling. Because if you can't rapidly iterate, every mistake is that much worse. And like with it, fail often, right? Like fail early, fail often. But if you can't iterate to recover from that, it's just kind of being, again, broken and making everyone sad. So how does Vault scale? And remember, this is how we're using Vault. Not trans backend, mostly secure key values. Vault's pretty chill. Um, it, it's not doing a lot. It's got, you know, we, we have maybe 89 megahertz average load compute-wise on Vault. Most Vault servers use about four gigabytes in, in active memory. Do need a lot of network performance. Now, Vault's not transmitting huge packets or anything like that. Um, but it certainly is going to have a lot of concurrent connections, especially as your infrastructure grows. So, with, here's the, here's the consumption. What should we monitor? What? Everything! Yes! <laughs> yes, you don't monitor one thing, that's crazy! You have some agent-based setup that's going to send like, oh no! <laughs> you have some agent-based setup um, that's sending full resource consumption information. 
you've got logs, but you have the audit backend enabled. You can see what's going on. And um, this is a DevOps conference, right? So if you're not sure what I mean by monitoring everything, I know for a fact there are lots of people in that cyclorama room that want to sell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you will know when your single point of failure is down. Um, and I know, like, is anybody here dealing with like compliance issues, stuff like that? Like, oh, okay, yeah. So you read that last slide like this, right? It's like there's nothing else on the slide. This big bold, a lawyer is going to be so mad, and I'm going to get fired. When somebody asks this, you—that's not a thing. You can't do that. <laughs> you got this option too. You could be the person who says, "I don't know." That's not you. Don't do that. So here's what I say: What kind of down are we talking about? When Vault is another four main ways that I have found that Vault can go down. My favorite, not down. That's one. <laughs> Sealed. It can be bricked. It can be gone. Mm -hmm. You know, your server fell out of the sky. Somebody deleted the whole thing. It's not good. The first place to go. Health check endpoint. If you haven't used this, oh, it's so good. Um, you can pass so many parameters to this so that whatever health checking thing you are using, you get the status code you need. You can take every state of vault. It's enumerated. You can pass something and say, send this, send this status. If you've got just basic monitoring, it's like, is it 200? Give me a 200. That second option is what you want. Standby OK equals true. Because standby in HA mode, and we'll get to that in a little, so if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, hopefully you will by the end of this talk. Standby is OK, right? It's unsealed. It's been a forward request. It's fine. You can say standby OK equals true. If you can't do that and you're fancy, uh, standby, unsealed, ready to work, but you know, just chilling right now, is 429 status. So you can configure yourself to do 200 to 429, and you're probably going to be fine. Maybe it's not down. Maybe it seems like it's down. The person who told you it was down can't get at the thing they want, and because they're not connected to VPN, or your buddy changed the firewall rules, and that was sad. Um, my favorite thing to do is token look up. Ask them how they're authoring to Vault. Try to find there, you know, you can look at metadata for current leases. We'll talk about that in a little too. Um, Vault token lookup, great thing. It'll list what policies that user has. Maybe they're just trying to access something they're not allowed to access. Tokens also have assessors. So if you don't know exactly what token they're using or they don't want to give it to you and they know how to give you the assessor instead, it is a non-secret reference value to a token. All you can do with an assessor is revoke it. You can also look up the thing to just see because like, if they're telling you it's down, and then you go and revoke it, that's fine. If it's sealed, you have you know, audit logging, and you can hopefully figure out why it was sealed. Uh, maybe it was just an accident. Maybe it's actually like a response, a secure response that you want Vault to have stayed sealed. Just unseal it. This is another easy one. It's like makes you feel good. Like, I can fix this. Because you probably have your unsealed keys stored somewhere secure. And if you don't, well, we'll talk about gone in a minute. But uh, <laughs> when, when you initialize a vault, um, and any, any of y'all who have a vault server, you know, it's going to five keys for you, and you have to give three of them back. That's called Shamir sharing. Uh, Shamir is the S in RSA, and it's an awesome way to make sure that like no single developer, no single team can like totally own your vault server. Um, but we have a lot of ways to manage access to information in the enterprise. Right? Like we can use our, our password managers to set teams and we can see what people are accessing. So you might not need or use Shamir secret sharing. And if that's the case, I suggest you rekey with a single key and make your life easier. Um, don't paste a bunch of keys in there, right? Just rekey with a single key. Um, Rekeying is a whole other thing, but the documentation is pretty good about it. The idea of that is to spread the keys around. And if you group the keys together and put it in one place, you already have a single key. So don't get scared just because it's encryption. If it's bricked, you have more questions than anything. And this is where, you know, monitoring everything comes into play. Why is it bricked? Is it taking a long time? Does Vault need more resources? Is it under some kind of attack? Give it what it wants. Sometimes, though, you don't know how to do that. And I have great news, because there is a new on-call support number for HashiCorp. I believe it rings directly to Mitchell's phone. Uh, and, and, and just, it's a very easy to remember number. 
You just pick up the phone and you dial 0118999 Don't leave me hanging. Three. Yes! <laughs> Your vault's gone. It's terrible. Mitchell's not answering. It's fine. Vault's not magic. We get scared because it's encryption. It's a single point of failure. Everybody needs it. It has to be up. I can't shut it down. You can shut it down. Maybe. <laughs> Three questions you need to answer for yourself and your team. And this is the main theme now. So if you've got notebooks, this is the time. How reliably can we boot the right version of the binary in the right place? How reliably can we reproduce the right configuration in the right place? And how reliably can we restore the backend data store? Vault is a totally stateless app. We do that kind of thing all the time. HA, this is the most complicated vault network diagram available. I checked. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. You have to answer these questions for yourself and your team. You have to iterate on getting the answers better. Look at where you're at today. How fast is it going to take you to get that thing back up? Just like you would with any other application, right? Use a consistent version. Vault is so friendly. It tries to not be um, breaking compatibility. But there are certain upgrades. So it's best, if you're in a disaster scenario, to not have more unknowns, right? So if you know you're going to spin up the same version, you're already ahead of the game. Template ties your config. I'm legally required to talk about infrastructure as code at this conference. <laughs> and so here is that slide. Um, it does not matter what you use. It really doesn't. If you can recreate your config, in a reliable, safe way that people on your team understand, you win. Now, this is the number one thing when somebody is going to adopt Vault and they say, hey, you like Vault a lot, and I say, I do. And then they say, what would you want me to know about Vault? And I would say, pick a backend you already know. Vault supports over 18 backends. It's crazy. Those are the ones that all support HA mode which you may or may not need. Some of those are cluster technologies that are kind of tricky to manage if you're not already doing it. Don't learn Vault and console. Don't learn Vault and etcd. If you don't know how to restore etcd, don't put something that's a single point of failure and have it back with etcd. Use something that you feel comfortable with. Why live rough? Live life smooth. And you might say, well, I'm already stuck because I have Vault today. It does not have to be complicated. We can migrate our back end. It's going to be so easy. You can still go go-karting with Avril Lavigne in a mall in 2000. <laughs> I got three more questions for you. I have a lot more than three. This slide has three more questions for you. Um, do you have a lot of dynamic secrets that have configured? Do you know how to reconfigure? Well, wait. Yeah, you want to be able to reconfigure. Do you have a lot of auth options configured, or are you not scared of reconfiguring? Do you have a limited access to Vault? Are you not a root user? Because if you're not a root user, don't try to migrate Vault, because it's going to be stuff that you leave, and it's going to be sad. So do that look and look up, and make sure you're a root user before you do what I'm about to show you. <coughs> you can use safe. I have a love-hate relationship with this first command, safe export. Goes into your key value store, decrypts everything, dumps it into a file. Oh, so awesome. But also, oh my god, what? No! No! I'm going to be a root user, and I'm going to put everything in a file. Oh, it's bad. But, but, if the trade-off is you do that once, and then you delete that file, and in exchange, you have a back-end data store that you feel comfortable with, that you can restore, that's not a risk. That's winning again. Don't be scared. That's it. You're done. Reconfigure your off backends. Reconfigure your, your dynamic secrets. We had a few vaults that we were worried about, and we wanted to move um, off of one backend and onto another. Um, and we remember that like, the data in vault is just like any other data. It's encrypted, it's garbled, it's nonsense. That kind of works in our benefit, because you can't effectively query garbled nonsense data. The, the schema that vault uses in all of its backends is really, really easy to understand. And if you move the entire backend, everything in it. You know that everything you have works. Users with active leases, the leases still work. Your same unsealed keys still work. 
your root token still works. What I'm trying to say is you take the data you get and you turn it into the data you want. Boom. That's a one line. Console KV export to DynamoDB import. One line of JQ. It may have taken me two days. <laughs> But I understand that that's what makes me a senior engineer. I can take two days on something like that. Um, no, but like, you see what I'm saying, right? It's like, okay, there's not a lot going on here. You got one back end is going to put the default at the end, and the other one has a little feel for it. Please, you can do that. Okay, uh, I want to leave you all today. A few gotchas. They burned me, they maybe have burned you. If you feel brave, and I hope you feel safe here, as I'm talking about these, just raise your hand if, it's, if, if you've been burned. Vault well, HA mode is not a way to horizontally scale Vault. Unless you're paying for Vault Enterprise, Vault well, HA mode is a leader and a follower, so if one gets sealed, the next one can take the request and you're all good. But if the reason you're getting sealed because you're getting DDoS and you DNS and you load balancer, it's putting everything at the other vault server, you just seal again. It also means when you think about structuring an HA vault setup, you really need to have each node large enough to handle all the traffic. Each node needs to be able to do everything that the other node can do. That's what it looks like. In reality, there is a connection between the secondary uh, and the data store, but it's only in the beginning, just to say, hey, I'm here, so, I can help. Yeah. Well, at least, top quote is from the documentation. I don't know who wrote it. I wasn't going to get blamed, but it's a good quote. Everything in Vault has a lease. Everything. When the lease is expired, so is the secret. Tokens are not an exception. The reason I'm telling you this will become apparent in a minute. When users or machines I want to put, uh, remember I said we had 6,000 containers? When users or machines authenticate to Vault with something other than a token, Vault creates and returns a token that it expects to be reused until it expires. And the default lease time in Vault, if you don't configure it, is 30 days. If you don't reuse those tokens, Vault doesn't know that you're not going to reuse it. It's going to keep it and persist the lease. And then you're going to do a DR test one day, maybe. And it's going to take 10 minutes to unseal your vault because it has to read 600,000 leases into memory. Um, fortunately, you can uh, use APIs, uh, the API in vault, to look at um, all the leases that are open, see their assessors. Remember, I mentioned with an assessor you can revoke, look at the metadata, try to find the ones that are, are not used anymore. Um, you know, make sure the thing that is offing, in our case it was a scheduler, the scheduler was re-offing every time, and, and, and you're kind of used to that from other paradigms, right? You use the name and password, you've got to provide it every time. Vault is different. The only actual way to authenticate to Vault is with a token. They provide auth services that you can hook up to make it easier for us to log in, and to make it easier to do authorization on those paths. But in reality, all Vault wants is tokens. Has. The API and the ACLs that you configure in Vault give the appearance of a hierarchy, but that hierarchy is not, it's not real. They're just they're opaque strings, um, and every key value store has to implement this abstraction. And this is something that was not obvious to me. And when you sit down at your nice desk over here and you think, like, hmm, I wonder how Vault works, you might come up with the fact that that's how it works. Yes, of course, it's an abstraction, and every back end has to implement it. That was not obvious to me, um, and we actually ran into a bug in the DynamoDB backend where if you delete something that was too deeply nested, and there are no other, like along that nested path, there are no other secondary secrets, the cleanup function was removing all the linkage nodes, all the way down to the base level, which means when you would go list what was in your vault, it would say, there's nothing in vault. I found that out during a deploy one night, my man. And he was like, I think that we 
I think that vault is empty. And we looked at the commands, and we're like, there's no way it could be empty. Like, that's the right command. That's the right command. It was right after we uh, moved to DynamoDB, my brilliant idea. I didn't feel good. And then we found out what happened. Um, it was just an implementation of the DynamoDB backend. And because vault is open source, we found the problem, we wrote a test for it, and we fixed it. Um, and I think, as you think about migrating backends, Vault is very, very stable. Vault is solid software. Um, and because you can go in and write tests and make it better, that makes it even better. And so, keep in mind that there are abstractions like that. It's not perfect software. And uh, if you find something weird, you should totally, you should totally help out. Um, all the backends have to conform to one test suite and one, in, um, one interface. So, there is a lot of testing that goes on, and for the most part, everything is totally stable. So anything you pick is going to work great for you. Last one. Ah, oh, yes. Come on. I know you've done it. I know you've done it. Vault write. It's not a patch. <coughs> Overwrites everything in the secret path. So safe, however, does function like this. I think the official vault recommendation is that you should really only store a single thing in any given path. But that can be kind of complicated. So um, I recommend safe. Uh, make sure that you don't run safe vault write. Because that's just vault right here. Anyway, I hope uh, that we all know now how to run vault at scale and you're ready to go and break your infrastructure and migrate your back end by answering these three questions. Same way you would anything else. How do you scale the vault? Same way you scale any other stateless application. So thank you much. Who has does anybody have questions on over your time? No, no time. No time.